Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Banks. I'm professor uh, in the University of Glasgow's College of Arts, and I'm really pleased to welcome you all to Circular Ceramics in the Round, which is the latest event in the autumn programme of the Deer Green Bothy. And the Deer Green Bothy is a six month programme of events organised by the college to mark the occasion of COP26 and to showcase the role of arts and culture in creatively, imaginatively, and critically engaging with issues of climate and ecological emergency. So our view is that arts and culture are not secondary, they're not subordinate to science, but absolutely central to the way in which ecological challenges and crises are mediated and um, represented and understood, and therefore, hopefully able to be tackled and addressed. And our events cover music, the visual arts, film, uh, the spoken word, uh, radio, many different art forms, and as in today, uh, the creative production of material objects. And all of our events bring together artists and academics and communities to collaboratively explore some of the dilemmas and the dangers of climate emergency as well as the opportunities and possibilities that might point towards more positive, uh, hopefully more progressive futures. So please look us up and find out more at the Dear Green Bothy website, which is pretty easy to find, I think. And um, we have a really strong programme running all the way up to COP and hopefully beyond. And we'd love to hear from you as well if you're interested in our work. And today we're welcoming the artist and cre creator Mella Shaw, who we uh, invited especially um, to organise a session that provides something of a taster for her forthcoming exhibition at Five Contemporary um, on creative approaches to the circular economy. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that, I think, shortly. But the themes of this exhibition uh, resonate very strongly with our own interests in the Dear Green Bothy in locating creative practice within the confines but also the possibilities I think of a genuinely sustainable economy and in promoting the ideas of repair and salvage and constructive reuse I guess and we're also thrilled that Mella has been able to bring along uh, Sarah Howard whose work has inspired the title of this event and Carol Sinclair to assist and contribute to the discussion and the handling of the objects which I believe but I've not yet seen involve some um, high-tech visual accompaniments so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so I will once again say thank you for coming along, I uh, hope you enjoyed the session, do come along to more of our uh, Bothy events and I'll now hand over to Mela who will be your host from here on. Okay thank you so much Mark, yeah just a big thank you to everyone involved in the Dear Green project for hosting this, but also just for inviting us to take part in it. And also just to say uh, hello to Cassie and Kevin, who are going to be behind the scenes helping us out with some of the tech through this afternoon, because we have lots of different kinds of things to share with you. Um, so just also to mention that there should be a, uh, you should have a QA and a um, button at the bottom of your panel and also a chat button. So if you want to ask us a question at any point during the afternoon, we're going to collate them all together and uh, you'll have an opportunity for us to put them to us and we'll answer them right at the very end. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A tab. And if you keep an eye on the chat tab, you can see that um, Cassie and Kevin are gonna share some links with you along the way during this afternoon. Um, so yeah, as Mark outlined, today's session, we're gonna be discussing the role of artists in the circular economy and having an opportunity to hear from two ceramicists working in innovative and sustainable ways with ceramics. These artists are Sarah Howard and Carol Sinclair. Um, we'll get to hear from them both individually in a while as they give an outline of their, their own practices. Um, but we're also going to be looking, in some, looking at some detail of their work along the way with a special camera that we used um, called the Wolf Vision Visualizer. And this is, um, if this is housed in the Hunterian Museum. Uh, so the idea is that um, basically we're going to have a, a way of almost sharing as if, we, as if we were all in the room and we could actually have a handling session. Obviously, due to Zoom, that's not really possible, but it's as close as we can get at this time. So um, 
before we start, I'm going to give a short introduction to myself and also the exhibition that um, that Mark outlined outlined that I'm going to be curating. So. Um, so basically, I am myself also a ceramicist. Some of you, some of you might know. Uh, I don't know if anyone can see me right now. Are we still on Mark? As of, uh, can anyone see me, or can you still see Mark? Cassie, could are you able to reply? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so this is this is some of my work. Um, I'm a ceramicist with a background in anthropology, museums, and the study of material culture. My ceramic practice is centered on formal themes of balance and environmental tipping points and thresholds. I also teach ceramics in various places, including Edinburgh Ceramics Workshop and also Central St. Martins in London as a visiting lecturer. Uh, like many artists and perhaps particularly ceramicists, I'm very conscious of my role in generating a lot of stuff in the world and using resources and energy in the process. My work often addresses specific environmental themes and is consciousness raising. Uh, for example, the, um, the image on the right there is my large scale ceramic installation harvest, which was drawing attention to plastic pollution. Um, that's quite an old installation now. Um, and then the work on the left is rare earth, a new body of work that I'm making about the 60 plus minerals used in smartphones uh, and the kind of um, mineral depletion that the inbuilt obsolescence in that field is causing. Um, so although I am going to keep making consciousness raising work, I just began to feel that this approach on its own wasn't really good enough. Um, and I got involved in a project called Making Circles that is run by Ostrero, um, educating school kids uh, about the circular economy through craft based workshops. Um, Obviously, I think we're all very aware that the current climate emergency is the most important issue of our time and the future of our planet depends on how we respond right now. Um, so it's widely accepted that moving towards a linear economy, uh, sorry, moving away from a linear economy towards a circular economy is a key part of the solution to the climate emergency. And what I found through de delivering these uh, workshops with school aged kids is actually, they totally get it, the next generation are way ahead of us and it's actually the adults that need more convincing so I'm I'm also a freelance curator as well as all the myriad other jobs that I do and um, at the start of the COVID pandemic pandemic I was commissioned by Fife Contemporary to curate a temporary exhibition about the circular economy to do just that to introduce these themes to a, a, a general audience um, unfortunately, the exhibition had to be postponed for a year due to COVID, but we're back on track now and you can see there it's going to be in the Kokodi galleries from the 26th of February to the 8th of May in 2022. So um, that's great that we're finally going to get an opportunity to show everyone our hard work. So the idea behind the exhibition is to introduce the key themes of the circular economy to a general audience, but through the work of contemporary artists, designers and makers. And just like Mark mentioned in his introduction, I really believe as well that it is these people that have the knowledge of materials and innovative creative minds that will allow this transition away from the linear economy towards a, a circular one, a circular one. Um, so in my next slide, this is taken from the Ellen MacArthur website, um, which is a great introduction to the circular economy. If anyone wants to look up more resources later, I'd really highly recommend, uh, recommend that. Um, and this one is also from her. So uh, we currently live in a linear economy where we take resources from the earth, make new things, use these up and then dispose of them. This take, make, dispose model is extremely inefficient and treats natural resources as infinite, which obviously they're not. Our current approach is unsustainable and continues to have a devastating effect on the environment. By contrast, the circular economy is a proposed alternative where we design out waste right from the start we also design out pollution, keep materials in use for as long as possible, reuse, reclaim resources and regenerate rather than deplete our natural environment. In order to make this transition, we need to think very differently about what we call waste, how we approach resources and our attitudes to ownership. So Sarah Howard and Carol Sinclair are both ceramic artists who will be showcased in the Resolve exhibition. 
and I'm really excited that we've got them both here to talk to you today. Um, but before we hear from them directly, I just briefly want to show you some examples of some of the other artists that are involved in this exhibition to give an idea of the breadth of the exhibitors. There'll be 13 exhibitors in total and all of their names are on the Five Contemporary website. And I think um, Cassie is also gonna put them in the chat as well. So you can see them there. I'm just gonna introduce a few of them here not go all, through all 13, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, the first one is Daniel Svan. He makes modular flat pack furniture and it's all taken from salvaged waste chipboard and other very low quality materials mostly used in office furniture that he repurposes in ingenious ways. Uh, it's more than just upcycling as his modular design um, is made in such a way that they are built for disassembly and this gives the furniture future possibilities and prolongs the life of each piece. It's an example of waste of function as well as uh, modular design. And my next example is DRAF. Um, some of you might know of DRAF, a Dundee based company set up by Emeric Renond. This is a fantastic example of a designer working with industry. So he takes the waste product um, and gives it new value. The waste is draft, which is the husks from the grain used in the brewery process. Um, and he uses this to make a completely new material by drying it out and combining it with a natural polymer that he's developed and then compressing it. So Americ then incorporates this new material into his handmade furniture pieces. And then next up, is Stephanie Cheong, who makes incredible jewellery from found Scottish rocks, like granite on the left there, you can see. Uh, so that image on the left shows the zero waste rock um, and reveals her dedication to using every part of the resources that she uses. Um, the work on the top right is called Interchangeable Ring. The idea here is that behind that there's one silver mount that she makes and then many uh, cut pieces of different rock that you can slip into the mount. Um, so this is a great example of design for disassembly again and this is one of the key principles of the circular economy so that you can take when you make something you make it in such a way that it can be taken apart again and those pieces can be reused. Uh, so in addition to these artists we have many others really fantastic makers, um, people like Chalk Plaster, a duo who are salvaging plaster from plasterboard and reconstituting it into gypsum which they're then using to make new objects. Also Sandra Wilson, who's making metalwork pieces from salvaged e-waste, uh, gold and silver and copper. And Sarah Kalmus, who's creating a moving image piece uh, about renewable energy shifts as we move um, towards the goal of net zero carbon by 2045 um, in Scotland. So these are all, um, I'm just gonna unshare now. These are all artists who are just approaching it in a each one of them in a really different way. And we're trying to just get the different themes of the circular economy across through their work. So I really hope some of you can have a chance to come and see the exhibition. Um, so before we get to, uh, before I can introduce Sarah Howard, I'm just gonna tell you a, a little bit more about the Wolf Vision Visualizer. And that's this special camera that's housed at the Hunter Museum. University of Glasgow that we were able to use in order to show some close up images of the work. Um, so Kevin and Cassie, could you please show the video now about the visualizer? Today's session was filmed in the Hunterian <laughs> Study Centre in Kelvin Hall, Glasgow, using the Hunterian Visualizer camera kit. The visualizer was installed in the Hunterian Teaching Lab amidst the COVID-19 lockdowns and is intended to provide the Hunterian with a means to support fully remote and blended collections based learning and research. It provides a sustainable model to accommodate a year on year increase in student numbers and democratises access, enabling much larger student cohorts, previously inaccessible to us, to use the Hunterian collections in their learning. It is also hoped the environmental impact of researchers travelling long distances to use the collections can be reduced with the introduction of digital research appointments using the visualizer. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so that just gave a little little introduction to uh, the, the space that we filmed in and also how the visualizer is used by the, the university and the museum. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Sarah Howard now, who's a recent graduate from the BA Ceramics Design course in Central St. Martins in London. 
if Sarah can turn her camera on. Hello. Oh, um, <laughs> Sarah won, I'm gonna, wanted you to be here so that you can blush when I tell everyone that you won the International 2020 Conscious Design Awards for the best student project in the sustainable solution category for your tableware collection called Circular Ceramics, which is absolutely wonderful. And we're gonna hear all about it. And so Sarah's gonna talk to us about that now. And then afterwards, we're gonna show um, a pre-recorded Zoom call between Sarah in London and me in Glasgow, where we looked at her circular ceramics pieces through the visualizer. And uh, I got to ask some questions directly at the time. So that will give everyone who's watching this now an idea of the pieces in a bit more kind of um, detail. I actually do have some here as well in my hands as well. So we can also look at some of the pieces. <laughs> Great. Um, OK, so over to you, Sarah. I'll turn my screen off. Thanks, Mella, for the intro and for inviting me to talk. Um, so today I'll be talking in depth about circular ceramics, what it is, and also how I approached the project, um, which started in my final year at university at Central St. Martin studying ceramic design. Um, and um, I'll talk about what I'm doing now, and then we'll move on to having a look at the objects underneath the visualizer. So circular ceramics is a tableware collection, which is made from 100% industrial waste. And it embodies three main objectives. The first is to reduce the consumption of finite raw materials. The second is to divert waste away from landfill. And the third is to educate ceramicists in making their production more ecological. So the circular ceramics collection consists of what you see on the left, which is the plate, bowl and cup, which we will see under the visualizer. And then on the right is the tray plate collection. Um, and this collection is produced um, by extrusion, so there's no electricity required to create the form, nor does it require any plaster moulds, which in the ceramics industry has a limited lifespan. And then alongside my ceramics, I also have the circular ceramics book, and that outlines all my methods of how to reclaim, process and substitute waste for ceramic production. And this is available for studio potters, small scale ceramic producers to apply to their practice while I work with industry to implement it on a larger scale. And it's released under the Creative Commons license attribution. Um, and that basically allows anyone to build, adapt um, and uh, build upon what I've done as long as they credit. So it creates this chain reaction of ceramicists adopting um, the same sustainable methods. So this research project began um, back nearly two years ago, and I was looking at um, similar to Mella's project called Rare Earth. Uh, I looked at the scarcity of uh, the raw materials that we use in ceramic production. And I came across this graph, which uh, made it really clear at um, the limited time that we have to consume some of the materials that are key in ceramic production. Um, and basically it shows all these elements um, that we use and how long we have left to use them based on our current rates of consumption and our known resources. So to fire our ceramic kilns, we've got oil, coal and gas, and that's expected to run out in around 2055. And then um, the last four bar charts are industrial metals. So that includes zinc, which we use as a pacifier in ceramic glazes. That's expected to run out at 2025 if we continue to consume it at the same rate. And then silver and gold, which we use as lusters, both of which are expected to run out at, in 2030. And then copper, which we use as oxides, expected to run out at, in 2038. And with scarcity comes an increase of price. So this is a graph that shows how over the years, particularly from the Industrial Revolution between 1950 and 2005, how the cost of materials has in, increased significantly. So the yellow line, which shows the ores and industrial minerals, you can see that dramatic increase. And what we're experiencing now in the ceramics industry um, in just the last week or so is how the cost of natural gas, um, how that um, increase in price is going to really affect the industry in Stoke-on-Trent, which is the hub of ceramic production in the UK. Um, and potentially the only way that they could survive is with loans from the government um, in order to keep producing. And then I looked at um, the scale of industrial waste from the ceramics industry. So um, in St. Austell in Cornwall, where China clay is quarried, nine tons of waste is produced for every clay, every clay, every ton of clay quarried. 
So that's even before we start making and start producing, there's already waste um, that's already been generated from the mining and quarrying processes before the bag of clay ends up at our studio door. And a typical tableware manufacturer consumes 300 tonnes of plaster every year and generates up to 600,000 um, pounds of glaze waste every year, which is all finite raw materials. And in China, the ceramics industry produces over 100 million tonnes of waste every year, so that includes the fired waste along from the mining process and um, the manufacturing process. So the impact of all of this waste is that villages are at risk of collapse. So uh, I was looking at a case study of, of a village called Yuri, which is in Kashmir, Pakistan, and the mining of gypsum, which is the raw material in plaster. Um, the mining of it is putting the village at risk of collapse and it's also generating dust, which is causing significant health issues amongst the village. Um, and it also the dust gets into the river Julum, which runs right through the center of the village and that contaminates it, which the villagers used as bathing and drinking water, causing further health um, problems. Um, and when industry disposes of slurries um, into open areas, it can contaminate the soil, causing a loss of biodiversity. Um, ground and surface water can be damaged as well, so um, agriculture can't grow anymore. And uh, consequently, it can lead to landslides and sinkholes, um, further disrupting um, ecology and Mella briefly touched on actually she touched on it quite in depth the circular economy um, and I've really simplified it here to take the three main key elements which I've applied to my practice so the first is to design out waste and pollution as Mella said keeping products and material in use and regenerating natural systems so currently the ceramics industry is pretty much producing in a linear way um, there are some recycling elements with um, unfired clay being continually used in the process. However, the circular economy would really solve a lot of the issues that we have with industrial waste and the raw materials um, scarcity issue that we're facing and will continue to worsen in the future. So um, when I began this project, um, I thought, yes, the circular economy, that's, that's going to fix most things um, and most of the problems that we're having. Um, and I started to do just that. So I mapped out the waste streams of Wedgwood, which was um, an industrial manufacturer in Stoke-on-Trent, um, looking at how I can bring these waste streams back into production. However, it wasn't that simple and it wasn't that easy, much to my disappointment. And because of the chemical changes that happen at the high temperatures in the kiln, often up to 1,260 um, degrees, um, sadly, we can't just get a plate and turn it back into its raw materials and start again. And I worked really hard at trying to close that loop, but it just wasn't happening. And then I looked at an industrial symbiosis, um, which is where the byproducts from one manufacturer replace the raw materials in another. Um, and I thought there perhaps was some potential there, um, working with other industries, replacing our finite raw materials, um, so we're diverting waste. Um, that would have gone to landfill to replace the raw materials in ceramic production. And so I went to the stone industry, glass industry, construction industry. Um, I went and mapped out all their waste streams, um, looking, about, looking at what was going where, what companies were dealing with the waste, what they were doing with the waste. And then I identified the materials that were going to landfill. So I was just looking at, um, I wasn't looking at anything that was getting recycled by industry, such as the um, glass offcuts, which can be continuously recycled without losing purity. Um, it was the materials like the slurries um, uh, and some of the contaminated waste that was being sent directly to landfill. And so these are close-ups of the materials. We've got the construction industry in the left column, um, and the middle row is um, what the material looks like when it's reclaimed, and the bottom is what it looks like once I've processed it, which is the hefty job and what I do is, is a really long process, um, but I need to get the materials into a state and um, so that I can use them in the same way I typically use and um, glaze materials um, when I produce ceramics. The middle column is the stone industry and then on the right is the glass industry. And so I built this hypothetical indus uh, industrial symbiosis where we're not all on the same ground, but I transport these materials by bike and take it to my studio um, and I'm saving these industries money on disposing of the waste, which can be really expensive um, as it has to be treated um, and then disposed of. And with the construction industry, they have a huge weight and load um, and volume 
um, which makes it really costly for them. So often these materials get um, dumped illegally. So it's a financial and ecological gain uh, for both parties. Um, so what am I doing now? Um, I graduated last year. Um, I still sell my book. Um, and I'm working with ceramic producers, um, mainly small scale batch producers, to help them introduce these waste materials into their practice. So although I have my plates, um, as my trade plates and my circular collection, those are an objects of, to show what is possible with these materials. But I don't want to keep producing more and more things. Um, I want to work with ceramic producers who are already making um, and help them make in a more sustainable manner rather than making more stuff which we don't essentially need in the world. And, and yeah, um, and hopefully at the end of the year, if COVID allows, um, I'll be implementing my methods at an industrial producer which supplies uh, ceramic tableware to hospitality and hotel industry across the world. So hopefully to have a bigger impact um, around the world. And then we'll have a look at the video now um, where Mel will be handling the objects, um, asking me some questions, the nitty gritty details about the work. So Sarah, we've got three of your um, beautiful ceramics pieces here from your circular ceramic collection. And uh, I'm just gonna lift, this is the bowl. that down just able to see the plate and we also have the cup here so i don't know if people can see but it's actually made from quite a thick ceramic thickness there the clay body i wonder sorry could you tell me a little bit how you made the clay body and what temperature it's fired to so the clay body is made from a uh, reclaimed waste so this is all the trimmings um, and offcuts of other people's clay um, and I use that to create the clay body. I also work with excavation waste from the construction industry and process their waste, which often consists of rocks and debris and clay um, to make the clay body out of as well. But I found when creating this collection, I produced a lot of second pieces. So pieces that weren't up to a high quality um, and they weren't very consistent when coming out the kilns. I had to weigh up the pros and cons of trying to incorporate lots of waste streams from different industries and just producing a stable and consistent product without producing too much waste. So I use my excavation clay body um, for products that don't require glaze, but for the circular ceramic collection, it's the reclaimed clay body from Studio Waste. And the reason that this collection is so thick um, is because I haven't addressed end of life in my work. So once a ceramic plate breaks, it generally has no purpose anymore and will be sent directly to landfill. So designing a thicker object that has a curved rim at the top reduces its chance of being chipped, breaked or damaged uh, when you drop it. And hopefully that prolongs the product's lifespan. Um, yeah. I'm just going to show the camera what you mean about this curved lip. If that's okay, I'll move the plate out of the way slowly. Really beautiful to hold in your hand. They've got a lovely weight. So you can see here, it's quite a pronounced curve on the lip. Also, um, they obviously have a greater sheen on the inside than the outside. I wonder if you could talk about um the silica content maybe of your glazes and just tell me a bit about that so the way that i develop glazes is when i identify a waste byproduct from industry i identify what material it can substitute in ceramic glazes which are made up of silicas fluxes aluminas and coloring oxides so the silicas are the glass former the flux melts the silicas and the alumina is the clay which stiffens the glaze and then you've got the additional oxides which adds colour, which I don't work with. Um, but by identifying um, what a waste material can substitute for, um, I can start to incorporate waste materials in the glazes. And you mentioned that has a slight sheen on the inside. That is completely by chance. It's, it's exactly the same glaze on the inside and outside. But with um, the different oxygen flows, especially in the kiln, uh, you can get a different, um, different finish, whether it's like a satin mat or slightly glossier finish in certain parts, but all the colour remains the same. 
Well, that's fantastic. It's so interesting that there is a variation. I really, yeah, it looked um, it looked like a different glaze. I wonder if you could tell me anything about this. There's, there's obviously some inclusions in the clay as well, just talk, going back to the clay body. So with the iron speckles, which is probably what you're seeing on the camera there is, so when um, glass panels are polished on the side, they also polish um, glass panels, which have the wire cross hatching in, and that's to provide strength. And that often ends up in the glass slurry, which I collect. Um, and produces those slight speckles. The same with that clay. I'm working with offcuts of other people's clay, which can vary from uh, stoneware bodies with um, high speckle content. Um, and it really varies from batch to batch what I'm able to produce and the finish, but it more or less looks the same, but the speckles can vary depending on the batch of waste that I am collecting. So we've just, um, stack them here, which is really nice. They sort of nest inside each other. I'm just going to take the, the cup out. So, would you be able to tell me about how you actually make the forms? I don't know if they're the process, if they're thrown or cast or jigger jollied. Originally, I planned to jigger jolly them when I had access to a jigger jolly. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, I didn't have access to one anymore. So then I had to learn them. Um, and actually, that process is a lot less wasteful than the jigger jolly process which requires plaster molds which have a limited lifespan in industry they use up around 30 times and then they're just disposed of and down cycled um, and used in in laying roads so by by limiting and avoiding the use of plaster but and just throwing the forms i actually reduce produce a lot less waste um, and yeah in my book i talk about how I sort of was able to combat that issue so slightly just by crushing up old plaster molds and using them um, as like a filler to create new plaster molds. So I wasn't consuming as much plaster, which requires gypsum, which is the raw material um, to produce that material. And the mining of gypsum has quite a large societal and ecological impact on the environment and smaller communities. So I'm very conscious of that. Um, and I don't currently use plaster anymore in my work, um, but in industry, it is, it is used all the time to create consistent forms. So interestingly, one of the other um, pair of artists that we're showing during Resolve, they are actually reclaiming plaster from plasterboard um, uh, and using, basically turning it back to gypsum and then casting with it. So it is possible to do, but it, is, it does require another whole stage of... <laughs> technology to do it so it's really fantastic that you've just sort of just cut that out of your process and that's really brilliant and they're actually very nicely thrown i didn't realize they were thrown i thought they were cast oh. from the foot ring you can just see the lines and yeah as we as we see the, the beautiful silhouette the problem with throwing them is that it's not a process that can be easily applied to industry so it's just it's much easier to jig a jolly um, and produce consistent shapes that way. And the other method that I work with is extruding, which can be applied to mass production. And you can produce consistent shapes really quickly, eliminating the use of plaster molds and also electricity. So you don't even need um, the electricity needed for a, a wheel. Um, so it's all manpower. Woman power. Woman power. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> You can really see the thickness if I hold it like that to the camera. So the main pr problem with working with waste is the consistency of the batches of waste that I collect and how they vary from one to another. Um, so I try and I work with the same manufacturer in collecting their waste and they often tell me if a batch might be different, whether they've worked with like a pinker glass um, and that can produce um, a slight pink hint to the glaze finish. Um, and so like, and with the iron cross hatching, the metal that can be produced, produces speckles in the clay as well. Um, but yeah, it's something that I have to test each time I collect a new batch. And often it doesn't require too much alterations within the glaze. And that's quite simple to do is just alter the ratios of the silica flux and alumina in the glaze, but ultimately it's just about testing each new batch to ensure 
um, and producing this similar finish each time. And you've, and you've got a sort of selection of suppliers that you're using more regularly now, is that right? So you kind of know roughly what to expect from each batch. Yeah. This is constant testing each time. Yeah, testing the new batch. And yeah, I have my main suppliers that um, I've been collecting from. And they also will tell me if something's been particularly different or if they've been working on a project that has been using different materials. So they'll give me the heads up in what to expect from the next batch as well. So it's really good. We've got really good relationship and they completely understand what I do. That's great. Do you feel like you're quite a novelty to them or do they kind of understand what you're doing and why you're doing it? Initially and it was yeah initially there is that confusion at what I'm doing um, and understandably I just have to explain why I'm doing what I do and the outcomes um, and also that building of the industrial symbiosis and but it's always been um, it saves them money in disposing of their waste. So they've never really objected to it. And it also just depends on the individual of the company. Um, there's some people who don't have any interest in what I do, and, but they still let me collect their waste. So that's fine for me. Um, but then there's others who really want to talk about it and like, talk about the next steps going forward and be involved in future projects. So, and that's really good to hear, but it's definitely a mixed reaction. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sara. That's fantastic to be able to get to talk to you while we're actually looking at the objects. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, apologies there, I was having, mine was certainly um, out of sync. I don't know if that was the case for everyone, if that was a streaming issue or something to do with the very meta thing we're trying to do here of showing a Zoom video while we're on a Zoom, a Zoom call. <laughs> but I think anyway, everybody will have got the general gists of what Sarah was telling us. Um, it was just, I just think Sarah's work is absolute fantastic example of circular design in action. And I'd also really encourage um, you all to buy a copy of Sarah's book. You can get them through her website, I believe. And if you are a ceramicist, yeah, get involved in, in the processes that she discussed so brilliantly in her, in her book. Okay, so now we're going to have an opportunity to hear from Sarah, Carol Sinclair. Carol, do you want to turn your camera on? Um, Carol is the second of the ceramic artists hi Carol, involved hi. in the Resolve, um, Resolve exhibition. Carol has a particular interest in material innovation, having been involved for over three years in the Green Plastic Research Group. And Carol's going to talk to us about her practice and the work she'll be making for the Resolve exhibition, and in particular, a very exciting new hybrid material she's been working on. So over to you, Carol. Lovely. Thank you so much, Mela, um, for inviting me to be here and, and to the, the, the Dear Green Buffy project. What a great initiative. Um, I'd also just say that I have a copy of Sarah's book and would strongly recommend it to anyone and everyone. And it's such a pleasure to see her in action having read the book. So that's great. So I'm, I'm just going to uh, share my screen and um, share some slides. Um, here we go. So hopefully everybody can see that OK. Um, so I... Uh, yeah, I'm Carol. Hi, nice to nice to be here. And I, I've been running my ceramics practice now for over 30 years. So you can imagine that my sort of approach to circularity and sustainability has really shifted over those years. And I wanted just to, to start by giving you just a little bit of an overview and, and tell you how I've got to where I am now. So for the first kind of 10 years I ran my practice, um, I ran a very commercial tile business. I, uh, I worked to commission to produce tiles for bathrooms and kitchens and um, cruise liners and television sets and all sorts of really exciting commercial projects. But as I grew my, my business and, and made more and more pieces, um, to echo, I think, what the other guys have already said, I just became, became more and more uncomfortable with making stuff. And particularly the idea of, you know, high-fired, very hardy ceramics, which are great for floors, but do mean that they're around forever. And, you know, they will be around a lot longer than I would be. And that just really started to make me feel quite uncomfortable. 
So I decided that I would take a slightly different approach. And again, probably echoing what, what Mela said, I moved towards more exhibition based work. I decided I would make less work, but I would make it in a style that told stories and shared ideas that were really important to me. And this particular body of work uh, was inspired by being a carer for my aunt who had dementia and I wanted to talk about uh, memory and connection and dementia um, and work with groups of carers. In fact, this is a workshop I did with Fife Contemporary to share with carers the, the making as a process of, of healing and health and well-being. But if you sort of look carefully at the, the top image um, on the left, you can see that the the, the theme I was working to was fragility and, and so the pieces I was making were delicate, um, loom, you know, sort of um, had light passing through them and really were not very hardy. And so it, that was another thing I started to, to want to resolve and thought to myself, perhaps I could actually start working with materials, other materials, uh, and see what that could do to, to work with the, the porcelain. And so um, as Mela mentioned, I started working uh, with a group of other makers, the Green Plastics Group, and we worked with a supportive interface. Um, I don't know if, if people know Interface, but it's a, a great organization that puts businesses in touch with sort of academic expertise. And we were put in touch with um, Professor Michael Shaver at the University of Edinburgh. And he and his team actually started making new plastics for us. Uh, plastic might seem like a, a slightly strange choice of new material, but actually if plastic is made from um, sustainable sources and plant materials, then it can be recycled and reused and is, um, is something that can be degraded as well. So you can see hopefully in the, the center of this image, the large clear bottle. Um, and this was the plastic that, that Mike uh, made for us from Angelica root, um, which sounded very promising, but quite quickly we realized there were two kind of key considerations. One is that it was actually um, very difficult for us to work. If you have a look closely, it looks a little bit like cotton wool. Um, and so it, it really was quite different. It wasn't sort of replacing like for like, but also it was very expensive and we just simply couldn't afford to keep working with it. You know, it, it, because it was a brand new material, um, you know, the, the, the source of Angelica root was, was not, not there to make it um, easy to access. So quite quickly, we moved over to using a plastic, a much more common plastic called polylactic acid or PLA, which is also made from plant material, sugar beets. Um, it's very cheap because it is, you know, in, in, um, used in a lot of, of different uh, sources. It's compostable, so it means it, it can be degraded. And really importantly for me, it's a type of material that I could use to combine with some of my uh, waste materials from the studio, my unfired clay dust. Um, so these are the um, samples, the first um, examples of, of the, the PLA and porcelain um, hybrid material. I actually started working at this point with um, Dr. Sam Vitesse from Napier University. And we started experimenting with combining the, the powder with the PLA. And you can see these sort of brown colors. The PLA sort of tended more to a, a brown tone. So we had to experiment and play with the color combination and the powder combination to get the sort of colors that we were looking for to really find something that felt like a, a realistic substitute for the porcelain. And you can see up at the, the very top of the, the screen there, this was our final piece that, that was actually very translucent, a, a lot like porcelain, and as close as we were going to get in, in color to it. But one of the other aspects, and, and again, we've, we've heard a lot already about circularity, and it, it was one of the other aspects that became really important as we talked about plastic. And this is an image from the Think Plastic Materials and Making exhibition that I took part in at the Royal Botanical Gardens a couple of years ago, where we really tried to address the circularity of our behaviours and looking at reusing uh, plastics, not just these new ones we were making, but 
those from our home and studio environments. And a lot of this work is from milk bottles and um, some of the plastic is recycled fridges. So we were looking at experimenting with lots of different recycled plastics. And this piece at Tipping Point is really the inspiration for the piece that I'll be making for the Resolve exhibition, because I really liked the, the sort of visual um, imagery of a mobile talking about our, our sort of environmental tipping point and the real importance we all have, uh, you know, the, the vital, the, the vital um, quest that we are all on to, to address that tipping point very urgently. So um, bringing together those two things, the circularity in my practice and the new material, these are, this is work in progress for the Resolve show. I've actually combined here the black porcelain that I use in my studio um, with the PLA to produce this really rather lovely porcelain-like uh, plastic. And one of the things that I can now do, which I've never been able to do with, with ceramic, is use laser cutting to get very precise shapes. And I'm working towards, um, sort of influenced by, by textile practitioners that I know, I'm working towards the idea of zero waste patterns, where there's absolutely no waste whatsoever. You can see the sort of silhouette of the cut shapes at the moment, and I'm working towards a, a technique of nesting, where you pull all the shapes completely together and minimize any extra waste. And I'm also continuing to use recycled plastics, which I, I really enjoy. And this is just a sneaky peek of some of the pieces that will be in the mobile for the Resolve exhibition. But I wanted just to, to sort of wrap up talking about my work, um, talking about this piece here. Uh, this is in a show at the barn in Aberdeenshire. I don't know if you're aware of, of the barn, but it's an art centre that has sustainability absolutely at its core. And this exhibition, uh, Meet, Make, Collaborate, it's actually on at the moment and it'll be on until the 7th of November. And the, the piece you see, the wings on the wall um, and the ceramics in front of it uh, are, are made, the ceramics were made by me, as was one of the wings, and the other wing was made by a collaborator, a jeweler called Rebecca Hannon, who's based in, in Canada. And we wanted to make a pair of human scale wings so that we could talk about our own individual responsibilities to look after our environment, to be more circular in our approaches. And so each of the individual, and I think there's 59 elements in each wing, each of those individual feathers um, is, is a small sort of research project in itself. And the, the materials I've used are porcelain from my studio, um, paper, wood, the plastic, and really looking at combining them all to be as circular in the approach to the creation of the work as possible. And it's really those uh, individual uh, feathers that we're now going to look at with the visualizer. Um, the two feathers you see here on the left hand side, one is made in porcelain and one is made in the hybrid material with a little bit of the detail on the right hand side. But if I come out of my PowerPoint now, I'm gonna um, ask the, the powers that be to show the, the film and I'll just talk you through what the visualizer um, revealed, if you like, to, to us about the materials that I'd been using. That's fantastic. And, and, and actually we don't have sound on this video, so there won't be any out of sync problem. <laughs> <laughs> Just great, stuff. great stuff. Well, I'll just I'll just sort of talk you through what you're seeing here. So this is is the porcelain piece. Um, you'll notice perhaps the pattern in it is is created using inlaid coloured porcelains. But if you can see, I've already um, reused pieces from the studio to make this this particular feather. So I'm I'm trying to use every possible technique to reuse and reuse so that I'm minimizing waste and I'm minimizing um, you know, carbon footprint. And actually, as we zoom in, what you can see here are a couple of brown lines and they may not look exciting to you, but they look exciting to me because I've actually managed to color the porcelain with some natural pigments, which is quite 
unusual because most natural pigments will burn out when you fire porcelain to the high temperatures. So that in itself was uh, was quite a coup and I'm quite quite pleased with that. But the, the, the visualizer really gave us an opportunity to look really closely at the texture. And as we zoom in again, what you can see with the texture in the porcelain is this sort of marbled effect, um, certainly to the naked eye. You know, porcelain looks quite smooth and flat, but actually as we get in a bit closer, we realize that, that it really does have a bit of a marbled effect. And so now that we look at, this is the, the first sample of the hybrid material, which was created using obviously the PLA, but with both black porcelain dust and white porcelain dust. And so what we're really keen to do, or what I was really keen to do was sort of emulate the finish of the porcelain. That was my, my first job was to try and, you know, create, recreate a new material that actually had the qualities and the finishes of the porcelain itself. So the, the piece, this test piece was made um, by mixing the PLA, it was melted to a temperature of 180 degrees and the clay dust was then added to it and it was mixed together. And as we zoom in, you can sort of see that similar marbling effect, that similar sort of texture in the, the PLA as there has been in the porcelain. And what I find quite interesting is actually that you know, as we get in closer, you can see that the the there's little speckles of, of the white porcelain. And, and that's really interesting because when I added the white and black porcelain powders together in my studio, I optically got a grey colour. But of course, as soon as you add the powder to the PLA, the PLA sort of wraps it round it. And what I could see from the visualizer images was that these individual components of, of uh, porcelain powder were remaining intact, which has huge implications for recycling. Um, so that was really, you know, sort of quite an interesting reveal. Um, and this final image is one of the final pieces. Um, by the time we got to casting this one and then cutting it um, with the laser cutter, we kind of got the hang of it. Um, so we had really beautiful, smooth kind of satin finish to the piece. But I think you can see really clearly that we'd also been playing with that marbling effect. We'd really been working with it. You know, the PLA and, and porcelain together, uh, we're, we were just learning how to use it. Um, and then this last little image of, the, of that particular piece, again, probably not as exciting to the audience as it was to me, but again, looking at the edge, you can really clearly see that the porcelain powder remains intact. It's not being melted properly into the PLA. The PLA is just simply coating it. And this has enormous implications really for um, being able to recycle. So I think that's probably all that we have in the film. Um, but I thought I might just sort of sum up a little bit what, what this all means and what I'm gonna be doing next with this, this material. Um, because we were in the, early stages we've been creating flat sheets and we've been doing that by casting them on metal formers to get that beautiful smooth surface but you know melting the the, the PLA to 180 degrees is very very different to creating a ceramic piece at 1280 degrees so the mm. the energy shift is remarkable um, and of course We've been creating flat sheets so that I could laser cut them, which is a whole new technology that I'm, I'm getting my head around. But of course, sheets of, of this plastic material can be formed, you know, in three dimensions using formers, just haven't even begun to try that yet. Yeah, that, that's so exciting. I have quite a lot of questions for you <laughs> about the material. I mean, if it's possible for me to ask you now, one of the yes. things is obviously with porcelain, it has a very high vitrification. And once it is vitrified, you can't then reclaim it. Um, but I wonder how, so you talk about the potential for recycling, but can can this be melted back down? The P, the PLA, can you remelt it? 
yes yes powder in it. so it can be basically reclaimed in a plastic way obviously not fully ceramic but yeah yes i mean the, the, we've already sort of recycled some of the off cuts yeah. we melted them used them okay. again but i think the the zero waste pattern would be my my preferred option yeah. so that we can sort of not have to use the energy of recycling but yeah. absolutely we can i mean i just think in like you were saying exactly i love this idea of using the nets so getting rid of any of the off cuts ultimately um but say if you were using it i'm just thinking of the kind of potential possible uses in industry of maybe using this material um what are the benefits of it do you think in terms of how um you know obviously it is biodegradable ultimately yes. um, so have you done any experiments of how long it takes to biodegrade or what kind of how what conditions it needs to be under or I don't know I mean I know you're at the very beginning and I'm so impressed with the work you're doing so I don't want to be adding loads of problems I'm just interested in how you move it forward into something that could really be used as a new material absolutely there's there's just enormous potential. I mean, one of the things we've been looking at is actually creating a 3D printing um, filament. Oh, so yeah. that's something that that could could be done. Um, I already have some. I just haven't had the chance to experiment wow. with it. But that opens up enormous possibilities for 3D printing. Um, but I think also, as you mentioned, it's the end of life that's really an interesting aspect. So. PLA is is compostable but in truth that doesn't mean you can stick it in the garden it means that it has to be industrially composted at this at this stage and that does have uh, an energy implication so that's something I do need to explore in a bit more detail but some of the early experiments we did um, actually with Mike Shaver were to because PLA is an acid we combined it with alkali to see what happened. And it took a number of weeks, but gradually the PLA just simply disappeared. Wow. And what we ended up with was a neutral, um, a pH neutral solution. Because one of the one of the other things I'm having to get my head around as I as I play with this material is some of this terminology that we throw around. And biodegradable is a, you know, is a term that we use, but I think Mike was very cynical about it because he said it doesn't really mean anything that specific. It probably means that we have good intentions that when something degrades, it, it sort of becomes either neutral or something that's not toxic. So I just really need to do a little bit more work on making sure that when we do degrade this material, that either we, we end up with something that is completely neutral um, or it's something that we can then reclaim the, the clay again, because obviously the clay has been unchanged through that process. So when you added the acid, was it then a slurry of porcelain at the bottom? Well, I've only done the acid with the PLA without the, without the porcelain. So that's why yeah. I'm, I'm the, this is the next stage of, of so, investigation. So much potential. I really love it that we've that you've shared it with us now when you're quite, you know, you're only halfway through the process. It's going to be really fascinating following it now over the next sort of six months and into the future years, see what happens. I'm sure it's going to be both you and Sarah. I'm sure it's going to have fa fantastic impact in lots of different ways um, in the future. Um, very much thank yeah. you for giving us a chance to tell our story <laughs> we you know well, we feel very passionate about these things yeah it's really important and it's, oh, it's they are important it's, it's wonderful sarah do you want to come back on the screen great well, just really wanted to thank you both very much for your your talks that were um just really enlightening even though i know you both and know your work i heard i learned lo loads more from seeing the images of, of your work again and stuff um i wondered cassie if we have any questions that you would like to answer otherwise we could have a little chat amongst ourselves i'm sure sarah and i and carol could uh Yes, I don't know if I can answer them, but I can certainly ask them for you. Um, so I'm the, the human equivalent of the roaming, roving mic just now. And thank you, everyone, for the questions that you've been putting in the Q&A box. The, it's an interesting mix, actually, of, of 
quite technical questions that Sarah has been um, answering away um, during the session, but it's quite pertinent, I think, to um, this question from Laura, who says, um, who asks, how do you manage to persuade the general public to stop consuming more and more products that they don't need? Most seem to be obsessed with constantly purchasing new products. So, um, how do you move away from this, what can come across as a, potentially a niche or a specialist interest and or open that out to the, to the broader public? Um, well, I could start with an answer to that, which is, I suppose, Carol, Sarah, myself, and um, what you're doing with the Dear Green Bothy project is trying to just get these term this terminology and the understanding that the circular economy is actually an alternative, trying to get that out there. So I, I'm, I mentioned the Dame um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the website, which I definitely recommend people look up if they haven't already. Um, one of the main sort of driving forces behind that is just to try and tell people that there is an alternative. I think we've all been just so kind of brainwashed really in a consumerist culture um, and an economy which is totally dependent on us buying things and throwing them away. So in the obsolescence, all of these things. And we do have the beginnings of legislation coming in to address that. Um, which is fantastic. So it's just about putting pressure on government, you know, the way you vote using every every possible tool you have to um, encourage um, a, a shift really in attitude. And that's certainly why I've wanted to put this exhibition on. And um, so for example, Sarah, you know, the book that she's produced is actually, the fact that she's made it open access is fantastic. So that will have an impact on lots of other makers and the more people that know, the more people that can spread the word. And I think it is, for example, you know, the work that I'm making in, as my, in my own practice about um, mineral depletion, I've, uh, you know, really it's consciousness raising, trying to make objects that make people think differently about the phone that's in their pocket. But I'm also trying to tell people about alternatives. So obviously there's a, a company which lots of people have heard of, but some people haven't called Fairphone, which is an alternative to your, your iPhone or Android phone, where they actually, it's it's a equally high grade um, technology in terms of the phone itself, but it's made in a way that it, it's made in a circular way, basically. So all of the minerals have been sourced um, in an environmentally friendly way. And then once the phone is put together and you, it's delivered to you with a set of tools, which means that you have access to taking it apart. And at every stage, if one part of it breaks, you can replace just that part. You don't have to throw away the whole phone and get a new phone. So I think there are, you know, as the demand shifts and more people know about this, there will be a, a response from the companies that are, are kind of making the products as well. Uh, so yeah, it's a drip drip at the moment and it's definitely going too slowly, but I think um, just spreading the word. Do, do Carol or Sarah have anything else they want to say? Just, I think just to agree, <laughs> you know, I think that that what we can do is use our voices and our, our you know, sort of powers of persuasion to raise the issue and certainly through uh, through the Think Plastic exhibition that we had at the Botanics, we actually asked people to make a pledge to say what they would do as a result of seeing the show. And I, I think that's that's what we want, what we all need to do is push each other a little bit. Because I, I know for me, the more I've looked into this whole area of sustainability and circularity, the more awareness I have of my, my own habits, my buying habits. Um, and I've I can then start to think actually, how do I change that? What what can I do that that you know makes makes a small difference? And and I think that's maybe one of the other things to feel that although we are all individuals, it's individuals working together that make a difference and that we've just got to keep at it and not feel overwhelmed. Yeah, absolutely. I've also um if Cassie could share some of the, I'm not sure if I've already shared the resources that I sent you. Fantastic. So they're on the chat. So um obviously the the exhibition that I'm curating is um, hosted by Fife Contemporary and on their website they have a fantastic resource called the Artist Environmental Resource. So for artists and makers they've put together I think it's like 46 pages of really helpful instructions of things you can do to actually make a difference or ways in which you can adapt your practice or um, other resources signposting you to other resources that you can use. So that's one fantastic thing. Also, if you're in Scotland, Creative Carbon Scotland has lots of really useful stuff. If you go to their websites in their tools and resources section, um, the company that I mentioned, Ostrero, that I work for, um, 
facilitating workshops, they have a really great website with, again, lots of resources and ideas of ways you can put pressure on um, people and other things. Also artists in Scotland, there's now something called the Circular Artist Network. And Cassie's um, just loading that up now. Brilliant, thank you. And so this is a fantastic um, opportunity for artists basically to share things. So I think we're all really aware as artists of often we're, we're actually quite good at um, using every bit of the resource that we can. We're often working on the tight margins anyway. So we're kind of a step ahead. <laughs> for that for more economic reasons. But um, for a long time, there've been lots of discussion, I'm sure started in many different forums about finding a way of actually sharing those things. So say if I have three pots of paint left, can I give that to another artist and in exchange get some wood if I need some wood or whatever. So um, Circular Arts Network have now put together, it's, it's almost like a gum tree for creative practices, practitioners. Um, so it's really great and you can you can post things you can say I have things and you can also say I, I want certain things and people can it's just a way of getting people together um, yeah so there's some there's some things out there I was really struck Sarah by by what you said about some of the um, the companies who sort of aren't really interested in what you're doing but you just get on with it anyway and I think in a way that that's quite an um, a useful model isn't it just kind of crack on and then be um, you can be an inspiration to others that way. Yeah and I think you have to find what motivates people or what makes people interested and often it's money um, so if you mention the financial savings that they're going to make um, by me taking the waste off their hands, um, then normally they're quite happy to hand it over. But yeah, yeah, there's definitely the mixed reaction that I talked about. And re in response to Laura's question and, and the consumer behaviour, I think like Mella's work in terms of the plastic pollution and the rare earth pieces that um, that you created, that those are really powerful vessels in creating behavioural change. But I don't think my work is, yeah, my, my work is providing an alternative and a better solution, but actually what might be better is that plate that's already sitting in your cupboard um, and you perhaps don't need a new one. Um, but yeah, it, we, it is sadly what fuels the economy is just us consumers buying more and more. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, as Mella said, like we drive the economy with what we buy and what we put into the economy in terms of financially. And, and if you set an example and, and to other people as well, um, especially in ceramics and um, I'm sure like I spend a lot of my time debogging the myth that it's not really the sustainable practice that it's put out to consumers to be and the finite ma raw materials that we're taking from the earth and it's not being generated as quickly as it, we're consuming it and letting people know about that often like people are pretty disappointed when they hear that especially if they're ceramicists but um, being able to offer the alternatives um, is hopefully like that light at the end of the tunnel for them. Yeah, that's really, really true. Well, we have um, a few of these technical questions. Um, there's one specifically here for Carol um, mm. about from um, from Ruth about what were the natural pigments used for the colour in your in the pieces that you showed earlier on. No, I was given them by an artist friend, so I'm not entirely sure I remember what they were. One was burnt umber. Does that sound like a natural pigment? And then the other was vine something vine. Well, it gave me the the darker brown. Oh, I should really know that off the top of my head, shouldn't I? Um, I've got the put you on the spot here. You, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get back to you? When yeah. I to you? <laughs> we'll put it in an email later. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for the question. <laughs> I, I wonder, um, Sarah, if there's anything else that you wanted to um, uh, to extrapolate on in the answers that you've already provided. So there were questions about firing. So do you fire your um, your pieces just once? Um, and another one that I have to admit is um, you may need to explain to me is do you work with XRD um, to understand the mineral content of waste? Oh, you on mute. Sorry. So the first question um, that Ruth asked was if my pieces are fired just once and it's something that I'm working towards and testing but sadly I get so many seconds and um, glaze imperfections when um, firing once. Um, not entirely sure why, still trying to adjust the glaze recipe perhaps to make that possible, but ultimately that is, I could uh, um, eliminate a whole vine from that. Um, but as I said before in the, in the pre, in the 
pre-film Zoom session, I have to weigh up the balance between producing more waste and perhaps adding an extra firing into the mix. And it's sometimes you have to pick the lesser of two evils, but it's something that um, I'm definitely working towards. And there's a lot of tableware collections now that are um, just fired once because of the financial savings involved in that, especially with now the high prices of natural gas. I think that's something we're gonna see more of, but um, yeah, um, in the mix. And the second question that Ruth asked was about the XRD, which is like X-ray visualizing the crystals underneath a, a very intense mi a microscope. But um, I told Ruth that, yeah, my, I'm, I'm not that clever. And um, yeah, it's, it's not as tricky and high tech as it, it can seem. Um, but I basically just work with industries that consume the same raw materials as the ceramics industry. And essentially what goes into the manufacturing process is what comes out, often with just a few imperfections and it's just slightly contaminated by um, either the machinery or the tools with the iron or the plastics that's used to protect the, mater the materials. Um, and then um, by knowing what those materials are that are going in, essentially it's the same going out, it's just in a different form. And then I work by substitution. So understanding what um, the material is that's going in, if it's like a silica flux or alumina, um, and then substituting that into the glaze. Um, so it's much more simpler than, than any high-tech equipment. I, well, I think you sound very clever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm, I don't think there are any more questions in the Q&A box, so um, I might step away. Oh, hang on. Um, there's one question here from, from Mark. Justin, um, uh, are there other art forms or disciplines that are also pioneering or advancing circular economy practices? Well, Maybe I mean, if I yeah. hand that over to Mela first. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, I certainly don't think ceramics is ahead of the game in this field uh, at all. I just, I mean, I think one of the things about ceramics is possibly because of the firing element, we have this stage, we have this very um, defined point at which after that, it's so much hard, harder to reclaim the material. So, you know, you can learn to throw with one bag of clay and a wheel. I always tell my students this, you just need to keep using that bag of clay again and again and again, and it can be infinitely recycled until the point that you apply heat. So I think because we have this sort of metamorphosis that happens right um, with the vitri vitrification of the clay into ceramic, maybe we're more conscious of one, the carbon footprint of the firing, but also the fact that we then have this material that basically um, basically joins the sort of rock cycle in terms of how long it will decay. So it literally takes thousands of years to decay again. Um, but I certainly don't think we're unique. I mean, I think all, all um, creative practices are having to think the, in this way now and that's certainly one of the reasons of for curating the Resolve exhibition is to introduce all these different makers who are working in so many different materials but all addressing it in a similar way um, so yeah 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 and you see it well I think you see it everywhere but perhaps that's just because like now I have an eye for it but yeah. the circular economy has been around for decades and it's been spoken about but perhaps only in like the tech last 10 years has it really been a focus because of the financial incentive involved yeah. uh, but the furniture industry is um is really huge in that and interiors fashion i would say fashion is actually like even though they've got bigger problems in the ceramics industry they've they've been really fast to act upon it um yeah. and some would say not as quickly but they, they are addressing it whether it's behavioral change or um, being really transparent about the materials and the process um, not everyone, but but it's but most. I, think, I mean, there are certain, so certainly in fashion, the fast fashion kind of um, outlook and the, that way of approaching um, fashion has become so ubiquitous, really. With fa fashion and fast fashion are really the same thing now. So I think that's kind of had to change. You can't really be, you know, coming up against the climate crisis in the way we are and continue to think that fast fashion is sustainable in any way so yeah i think it's 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 interesting how different industries are having to respond in their own ways yeah. and the jewelry industry of course has, has been sort of having to really think about sustainability of materials not just in 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 terms of of 
scarcity, but also in, in terms of the people and the, the planet. You know, I think Sarah talked a lot about mining and, and you know, jewellery has, has big problems there, but have been really, you know, ahead of a lot of other parts of the making sector in trying to address those. So I mentioned one of the artists very briefly that will be showing in Resolve, um, Sandra Wilson, uh, who's, who's, she's a, a, a goldsmith, silversmith, metal worker, um, does make jewellery, but also is going to be showing some bowls that she's made from, from salvaged e-waste gold. So gold that's taken directly from um, electrical equipment, essentially, that's been put into, um, into landfill. And obviously now it, it, this crosses over with work that I'm doing in my own practice, um, that we're getting to a point soon in the next few years where it's actually going to be more economic to land to mine land uh, land to to mine for gold in landfill than in natural habitat for gold um, mm -hmm. sources uh, because there's just so much wasted um, precious uh, metals in e-waste so yeah that's that's a really big issue now Obviously. it's um what I often find with these events, these um, Dear Green Bothy events, is that I'm sort of equally um, <laughs> cheered and sort of overwhelmed, <laughs> you know, by by everything that comes of them. And I wonder, um, as we look to, um, to to round things off, is there anything that you that th that you want to share with um, with the audience about um, what next? You know, you were talking about what next in your own practice, but is there anything that you would want to to share to um, to maybe help with that feeling of potentially being overwhelmed by it. Do you want to go first, Carol? Well, I'm, I was just going to say that, that um, I think collaboration and working together is a really good way of feeling that you're, you're not alone and that you can sort of throw ideas around. I'm, I'm part of a, a, a group of makers called Closing the Loop Group and we meet once a month online so we can just exchange, you know, our, our particular challenges and we, we sort of throw problems into the mix and see if we can together come up with ideas and solutions. Um, and it's been really, you know, helpful because I think every now and again, you just feel completely overwhelmed and think, what's the point? Um, you know, and it, there was a really interesting blog actually by a, an organization called How to Save a Planet. Um, and they had a really inspiring uh, blog that just sort of did say, address that whole thing of as an individual feeling really overwhelmed and then sort of just really reassuring people that we just need to speak up. We need to speak up and we need to be challenging things that we realize are, are not right. You know, things like our, our local sort of recycling, if it's not recycling the plastic that we're putting into the bins to be recycled, we need to hold them to account. So I think, you know, be brave, be strong, link arms, and we can do it together. Yeah, I mean, um, I think there are so many people working in, in isolated ways to make a change. What's fantastic, exactly what Carol was saying, is if we come together and galvanize and actually en masse, we have a much more opportunity to make a difference and, you know, just to blow their trumpet for them, five contemporary, Diana Sykes and, and um, Susan Davis, who are both working really hard to get this agenda, to keep it there in Scotland. And, you know, by programming Resolve and giving me the opportunity to put this, um, the sector economy out there in this form, you know, they, it's people like that who are actually um, giving artists the opportunity and uh, exposing these issues to a, a bigger audience and bigger, a wider public they're the th people that are really going to make the difference and um, there's also something i mentioned ostrero a couple of times um they've come up with an idea which is just in early stages right now of a creative coin so for practitioners have they been in touch with you carol i hope so. yes i'm speaking to you very soon i'm very excited about this yes so it's an alternate alternative currency um for people in the creative industry so basically for people who are trying to make a change in their own practice um, it would be a way for that to be recorded. So for, so you'd basically, um, I'm not quite sure what their terminology is yet, but you'd basically get a reward. And then we would basically have a currency between us that helps us share and um, improve our circularity. So yeah, there are lots of initiatives happening and it's, I think it's a really exciting time. We have to be excited about the change and yeah, take people with us basically. 
Yeah, and I'm, I also feel excited and people often feel like quite negative and overwhelmed by the news or like what things that are happening that just feel so monumental that we can't combat. But being in this sort of like really quite niche group, um, like I'm exposed to a lot of artists, designers who are working towards the issues and like so many people like just so intelligent and they're and I'm like amazed at what's happening and I was just part of like an exhibition with 30 graduates um, working in sustainable innovation um, and to see that work um, was just like really uplifting and to speak to like-minded people was really good mm -hmm. and on the back of that like education is also stepping up so like on the ceramic design course we implemented the sustainability um, part of the assessment criteria so like in order to get a good mark your work has to be sustainable and that it's non-negotiable anymore it's not um like a it's not like an extra mark you're just filling the quota essentially um but to echo what carol mellis said about collaboration um there's for me like and working with other industries I've, I've found answers through working with other people outside of ceramics and same with carol working with hybrid materials working with the plastics like there's there's answers when when you explore beyond your own practice which i really encourage mm. I think that's part of, um, it, it's so um, encouraging to hear, and I, it's certainly part of what we're hoping to achieve with um, with the Dear Green Bothy. Um, and I wonder if um, off the back of this, maybe one of the things that we can do, we'll certainly share all of these amazing resources that you've been um, we've been sharing in the chat um, in a follow-up email. There's a question about whether the, the discussion will be available online afterwards, and it certainly will be. It'll be up on, um, on the Dear Green Bothy website, which um, we'll, we'll send you a reminder of but it feels like let's use each other you know this is this can be the beginning of that conversation and that interdisciplinary work um as we look look ahead to the exhibition in in february brilliant thank you so much no problem i'll step away because i'm going to put a few more things in the chat box before we um before we dive off but i'll leave, i'll hand over to to you mela to to um, round things off okay great so yeah, I mean, really, all there is, yeah, I think that was a really lovely to have a little chat between us at the end there. I really just wanted to obviously thank Carol and Sarah so much for taking part, for sharing so much of their practice, and, and also being, being so open about ideas for the future and what's next for you both. Um, I also personally like to thank again Five Contemporary for the opportunity to host the exhibition and obviously the Dear Green Bothy project and um, Mark and Cassie have been obviously supporting us all in this today and also Kevin who's been behind the scenes throughout. Um, I'd also like to thank Lizzie O'Neill as well in the Hunterian Museum who did all of the focusing and in introducing us to the camera and the technology. Um, it was a little bit clunky today <laughs> as we showed it but um, hopefully it gave people a little bit of a chance to see more up close some of the objects and you know that machinery in itself is quite interesting because it does provide uh, an opportunity for people um, to have access to the, the collection at the Hunterian, people who wouldn't normally have access to it, and also people who would sometimes be traveling from where, places all over the globe to come specifically to Glasgow to see those objects can now see them uh, remotely. So there is a sustainable kind of side to that technology as well, which we wanted to point out. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's everything from me. Um, I think Cassie said this is going to be shared on the D Dear Green Bothy Project website. It's also going to be on the Five Contemporary website. And uh, I hope some of you can come to the exhibition um, in February. I'm looking forward to it. Great, thank you. I think Cassie's still sharing things. So um, I think we can, everyone is just slipping away now. Yes, so you're all very welcome to leave when you would like to. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. And thank you, Mella. Thank you, Carol. Looking after us so well. <laughs> okay, take care.